Welcome to Meets Pad, a platform dedicated to sharing breakthrough knowledge that is accessible to the meats industry. On each episode, we will hear from meat specialists and professionals to talk about numerous topics in meat science, including animal welfare, meat production, meat quality, food safety, and so much more. Hello, me folks. Welcome back to the Meat Spot Podcast. My name is Rinsko Nahar, and I'm, I'm your host today. Dr. Bass, how are you? I'm doing great. I, I'm excited to be here as usual, Francisco. And you know what? I'm your host today because yes. we're going to do things. And yeah, <laughs> I'm going to put you in the hot seat. Um, so folks that have been listening to the Meespad podcast since its inception, since, since this, this brainchild of Francisco's came to be in existence, some of you may have noticed that it started out as uh, Francisco Nahar, graduate student. And now it is Dr. Francisco Nahar. Uh, you, you received your, your PhD, your doctorate in meat science um, uh, uh, about a year ago, maybe. It was probably about a year yep. ago. Yeah. All right. Okay. And, and one, of the, one of the big topics that, that you were working on um, was something called a meta analysis. And it was a meta, meta analysis. Uh, about meat color. So we want to talk about that today um, because the paper is now published and we need to digest what it is because this is a big, this is kind of a big deal, but digest it down to, so, so that the majority of folks can kind of understand what this meta analysis is. So first, Francisco, I want to ask you about this. First, what is a meta analysis? Yeah. Well, let me uh, let me back up a little bit. Don't be too technical about it. No, I won't be too technical <laughs> about it. But I, I I just want to start start off by by saying what what meta analysis is, but also why you did it. Um, so back in and when I was finishing up my master's, I, I did a, an internship. I did the the privilege and, and Dr. Hauser. Well, he was still in in uh, K State. Uh, helped me to get an internship with Hy-Vee. And for some, some of you guys uh, may know Hy-Vee, who Hy-Vee is, but they're uh, up in the Midwest. Um, Midwest grocery it's, chain. Yeah, yep. it's a, a, yeah, it's a big, a big grocery chain. Uh, uh, has presence in Missouri, Kansas, um, Iowa. They're from Iowa. Anyway, so I, I always been uh, very conscious on food waste, uh, and more particularly in my case, meat waste. And um, this all came up because I, 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 as an undergrad, I had the, the, the privilege to go to, to Ireland as an undergrad and living by myself for one year there. And, and I saw some of the, like in Europe, um, they're somehow more ahead of us, ahead of a lot of people and from the sustainability standpoint. I like the episode with uh, Jennifer, we touch on animal health and some of the sustainability and the, how, how we have to utilize the entire animal and, and, and that stuff. But anyway, so I, I wanted to study, uh, some of the, um, means to help retailers to understand the color stability, um, of, of meat, fresh meat and, um, the things that they get in, in a, in a way of, of a loin, vacuum package uh strip loin when they cut it at the store technically i mean they they're gonna display it um aerobically and just going back uh just a very quick in france when i was there i, I saw like even if they they throw away a pound of uh, produce a pound of of food you get a fine like yes it was at that time it was like seven thousand euro fine for just throwing away food they have to give it away in the United States, it's a little bit different because you have a lot of the, the liability issues. So they, a lot of stores, they don't. A lot of stores, they just throw it away. Uh, but one of, one of the main factors that I, I found at this internship, and because uh, I studied like why, how much they throw away and why they throw it away. And almost like 70% of the meat that was thrown away was because um uh, uh, it started to discolor on the surface. You have uh, all that uh, discoloration or oxidation, the, the midmyoglobin appearing on the surface. And people, they just, they, it's not attractive anymore to the consumer. So they start to discount it. And sometimes even if they discount it, they don't sell it and they have to throw it away. 
So, but I, I really wanted to study that 70% in, in understanding some of the, of the factors that affect that stability. One of the big major factors is postmortem aging time. Uh, when we talk about postmortem aging time, well, it's a little bit of technical, but it's the time after the animal is being harvested. And typically in, in states, you have uh, from seven days to up to 90, 100 days of, of aging time, which are we talking here about wet aging? And this is always a misconception. We talk about aging. So a lot of folks, oh, are you wet aging or dry aging? No, this is, we're talking about wet aging in the back. So vacuum package, keeping the product fresh, keeping the product uh, in under refrigerated temperatures. And uh, so we talk about a lot about the aging and how the enzymes, they, they, they work to get, uh, to make uh, meat more tender anyway. So, so they have this time um, and every week that he, that he, every week that he passes, we have less color stability on the meat after it's, it's caught and displayed. For many factors that we, we're not going to touch on, on, on some of the mitochondria activity and the NADH, but th this is a fact. So the more you age the product, the less color stability. So, and that's, that's data. That's uh, there's a lot of papers, a lot of data saying that the more you age it, uh, the less time uh, we call it color, color life or color chef life. You mentioned uh, technically just talking about the color on the product. You're not, you're not talking about quality. You're not talking about uh, uh, food safety. We're talking mainly about color, color, the color life of the product. Yeah. Yep. The appearance. So, so I visited with an, um, Dr. Hunt was a, I mean, everyone, a lot of, I mean, everyone knows who Dr. Hunt is. And we, we started looking at some papers that, that he did back in the 90s, uh, early 2000s. And yeah, so we, we ran some, some uh, statistics to see, I mean, just the effect of postmortem imaging time or harvest time on, on, on color of fresh meat. And yeah, so we have this trend. So the meta-analysis part is just using a lot of data not only one one article uh, to answer a question and extract the color data and, and try to to first of all find the the threshold uh, for when meat is no longer acceptable and and after that we got that threshold that borderline threshold for for color life and then we apply it to to several um uh, postmortem imaging times and and we actually we wanted to see a, a little table to come up with a table of some information for that it's easy to understand just to understand the impact of of postmortem time. I think that was this was uh, <laughs> this was a, a lot of information but mm -hmm. uh but this is basically it. So and to boil that down a little bit to to so first off there was the inception of the idea of where we have food waste and food waste is a big topic right now in the meat sciences and the meat industry and and for processors out there i mean not only is it is it costly um as far as dollar amount but it's costly as far as public perception we don't want to we don't we don't we don't, we don't we don't want to be wasting what this animal has provided for us. It's the right thing to do. Um, so what? So so beyond that, Francisco had had taken it upon himself to look into how. What does the data say as far as the greater meat science community has has reported about reported on as far as aging time and color stability once the meat is cut and displayed. And so I and I and I did a quick count here. So what you looked at was over thirty research papers now folks out there a research paper is a is a whole project and sometimes that takes over a year to do um it's a lot of resources but that's what the academic community does is to spend that time really digging into the information that the science is telling us so 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 francisco looked at over 30 francisco and his team looked at over 30 research papers, which means 30 different research projects, the power of a meta-analysis over just a single single snapshot of, of a research project, the power of meta-analysis is looking at over many years and many different- Many data points. Yeah, many yeah. different research uh, projects. And so, so 
Okay, so you did the meta-analysis, which means you looked at all of this massive amount of research. What'd you find? So, and you mentioned 30 research, and I, I wish uh, it was 30, because it ended up being, I think, over 100, uh, like the entire papers from 2000 to 2020. Uh -huh. um, but you, you cannot use all the papers. You have to read them. You have to understand the data. I mean, when you talk about color, there's certain things that, I mean, you, you got to look at temperature of, of, of display. You got to look at the luminant. So the luminant is, we got to, to, to record objectively color uh, measurements. There is, there's many colorimeters, which, oh, I mean, you can call it that way. The, so the unit of the machine that, that, objecti that objectively assess the, the color of meat. So there's, there's a lot of them. For folks uh, that are out there listening and, and not familiar with a colorimeter, if you've ever gone to a paint store and you brought and you brought in a sample of a color that you want them to use, they can they can use essentially a colorimeter that takes a snapshot of that, and it will mix the paint color that you want, but it has to measure the color objectively, and that's and that's kind of what we do in the meat sciences. We have a variety of different colorimeter. Um, type readings that uh, that that can be used and different lighting sources and et cetera, et cetera. So so yeah. so you had to boil that down from just just how it was measured, okay, to um, to steak thickness, pH, um, temperature, how, the different lighting types on the meat itself, yeah. right? So was it fluorescent? Was it LED? Was it just natural lighting, et cetera? Yeah, yeah. Oh my goodness! You're, you're trying to you're trying to get. I mean, you got. I mean, you, you're taking a lot of data, but you you at the same time you're trying to boil down the 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 papers that use similar uh, conditions. So the answer is a more accurate and more uh, concrete uh, answer, and not and even even the animals, even the, the genetics and the feed. A lot of these papers were done in, in the states. If you, if you start thinking about animals that that are or beef that is uh, finished in, in Ireland or New Zealand in a different um, diet, it won't have the same color results. So different you, factors. So that's why that's yeah. why I ended up with uh, only thirty papers because there were a lot of out there, but just to to meet my my uh, search criteria have to boil it down to so it makes sense when when you run all the all the statistical procedure. Uh, the, another big one was within colorimeters, you have different illuminants. You have illuminant A, you have illuminant C. You know, it all depends on, on the research team and as to which which illumina you're trying to to use. You look at the color guidelines um, by MSA, um, they recommend using illuminant A because it focuses more on the red of things. So um, if you don't do a lot of uh, color research, I mean, you don't, you're not going to understand all this stuff. It's a little bit technical, but just understand that there's some conditions they have to meet to make this uh, applicable and, and make it representative to, to the data. Okay. Um, so, so, so what did, so what did you find after isolating it from hundreds of papers down to 30 some um, individual projects what were some of the findings that are are important and relevant to our processing and, and retail listeners? So, uh, I'm actually like looking at looking at the paper, but the, the table that that I really wanted to come up with, and after visiting with a, the statistician, and I needed I needed something simple for for retailers that not necessarily understand a lot of meat science and meat color, but I needed something simple so they can understand. Uh, the, the time after harvest. So we found that uh, we're talking about strip loin and, and, and that's another thing. You have to look into the muscle. Yeah, you, which I mean, muscle you, specifically, right? Right. Yeah, you, cannot, so. you cannot compare uh, strip loin, which is a more like uh, glycolytic muscle to, let's say, just taking into account um, more, uh, I don't know, something from, from the chalk. From, so from the oxidative to, muscles, yeah. right? Yeah. So, so, you so have, the you tenderloin, have to, yep. Correct. So you have to pick a muscle and use that muscle throughout the whole study to compare apples to apples, correct? 
So uh, we used in this study, we used the strip loin, the, the Lagissimus lumbar muscle, and the, uh, and the Swaz major, the tender loin. And it's funny because these muscles also they were the most used um, in the in the literature. In the I mean, research, a lot of yeah. a lot of a lot of scientists, a lot of research papers. When you're trying to look at at color stability or other treatments, they go and, and study or evaluate the the Lagissimus lumborum, the strip loin. Um, it's probably one, I don't know, something that it's widely used uh, in, the, in the industry and also in the, in the literature. Well, and it's a, it's a high value item that's very consistent for the processors out there. The strip loin is, it's pretty much one muscle. Yes, if you get to the more posterior sirloin end, you get to, the, to, the, to that, that vein end. But for the most part, it's a single muscle. And for research, you want to put your, your emphasis on the, the most impactful and then, and then the, the least variable. And so, so it makes sense to look at very impactful tenderloin and strip loin. Yeah. And, and just going back to, to, to your question on what we found uh, under the conditions we follow on that criteria, we found that uh, between zero to 21 days of after harvest, those first 21 days after the animal has been harvested, uh, cut into uh, or separated from the animal into loins, um onto smaller pieces you you keep that uh strip loin uh, vacuum package for 21 days or up to 21 days uh, you're going to expect up to seven days of color chef life that meaning that the first 21 days you get the most out of the product from the color stability standpoint here's the opportunity when we go past the 21 days we start seeing the, a, a more like a, a color stability issue when it comes to um, the, the timeline. So we go to after 21 days, specifically 20, 22 to 28 days, we go from seven to five days of chef life. And as you continue, the, the days of color life of the product after it's been cut and display, is, it becomes less and less. Here's the opportunity when we when we always talk about aging, we talk about uh, we need to age this product for a long time because it's going to be more tender. But we, we need to find the baseline from and I think we've spoke with uh, uh, your colleague, Dr. Coley at Idaho uh, Dr. Michael about Coley. this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Michael Coley. Yep. About. So yeah, you need to get the more a product that is tender, a very high quality product, but also you want to be able to sell that and get that the most out of that product in terms of color. So it, and I think that's something to consider. And and I make I made an example on, on my on my dissertation on my defense. Let's say you you um, you're a retailer, you you are in the uh, in that in that world that I mean I I buy, I purchase, procure a lot of a lot of meat and and then I display it, I have my meat shop. Um, it's good to understand like the more you age it, the more the less time of color life you're gonna have. So and maybe there's some strategies for for those folks that are saying, okay, I'm buying one truck of strip loins that are, that are already just to put an example, already 14 days of aging, um, which is good, first quality good. You need to just start thinking about, okay, so one truck, so how many pallets, how many boxes, and start thinking your logistics wants to get, once it gets to your warehouse and once you distribute that product to all the retail stores and once that product is sold, I mean, it can pass another 15, 20 days. I mean, it just, I mean, you don't know, but it, it could be um, to that extent. So it's, it's important to understand if you know that you may going to have product that is aged that long, maybe start thinking about other strategies. Maybe you send it to the restaurant to cook it. Um, maybe you can use it in a different market so you, know that you don't display it and you don't, you, you don't lose any money by, by having to discount it or by having to, to, to do something else with it. I don't know. That's it. I, I just wanted to have this as a, as a, more like a conscious um, making people more aware of what they procure so they can understand what to expect is more like a preventive. And we, we, I mean, when you had this conversation with um, Jennifer recently, we talk about preventive. Yeah. And talking about, talk about preventive, um, preventative health, 
um, for for livestock and it, <laughs> prevention is so much uh, less expensive than trying to heal try, than the cure, right? And so if we can prevent a, a circumstance, a challenge, and 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 obtain an opportunity instead. Then we can find that. And so, so to kind of recap a little bit of what you're saying is that if we know how much age is already on some product, um, we need to just be able to balance the age of the product with how much time we need to sell that. And so if you're saying, if we, if we get a good buy on some product that has a long age on it, um, say, say we're, we're getting into the 35 day age range of some strip lines, but we got it, we got it for about 20 cents less than everything else. Um, we just have to know that we can't overcut. We don't want to cut more stakes than what we can sell in say a three day range, because if we, if we cut too many, now they're starting to discolor and now we have to shrink yeah. and, and God forbid we have to throw it out. Right. Yeah. And, and the other strategy on that is maybe you, you can cut but you can vacuum package, but it's, it's going back to the, to the consumer. Well, maybe you vacuum package it. Like the consumer is not, I mean, sometimes they don't like that purple yeah. color of, of that steak. Um, and we, we, I mean, we, we visited about how other countries in South America, they started to using vacuum packaging uh, to, and um, to extend the chef life of the product, but also the color, but. And vacuum packaging color. makes a lot of sense for a really small, um, operators that maybe have a retail outlet and possibly even sell a lot of product frozen. Um, but for those who have a fresh case, it's, it's not an option, right? So, so that's where you have to consider how much age is on that product. Aging is a good thing, by the way, just to remind everyone, age, aging beef is a good thing because it improves tenderness and palatability. But like you're saying, what you found in the, in the meta-analysis and what, what Dr. Michael Culley also has, has, has found, uh, my colleague, who you reference on page number one of your meta-analysis, by the way, which is really cool <laughs> to see that, is that the longer you age product, the less stable the color is going to be. And so you just have to manage that. If you, if you want really long shelf life, you have, to, you have to compromise with greener product, as we would say. If yeah. you want really super palatable, long aged, super tender product, you have to understand that you can't cut too much ahead of time because it's going to discolor quickly. Yeah. Yeah. Because ultimately the consumer buys through their eyes. Yep. They right? see with so their eyes first. Even yep. if it's, yep. even if it's tender, well, if it's, if it doesn't have a good color, being aware of that and just balance, have a good balance. And yeah. And I think uh, that that was the the main objective of this paper. We can we can do it in other muscles too. Mm -hmm. And as a plan, I started working with other muscles and uh, possibly other species as well. To just looking at at the impact of of post mortem imaging time on on color stability. Um, but yeah, so so um, and I and. We're, we'll, we'll go ahead and wrap this up pretty soon, but I do want to ask real quick, because you mentioned, you've already mentioned that we can go down the rabbit hole of, well, what if, what if we consider this factor? So finishing nutrition factor, what if we consider all the different muscles and those kinds of factors? So can you just real quick talk to the audience a little bit about other, other factors, um, anti-mortem factors, especially that are going to affect meat color that maybe weren't necessarily able to be addressed in this particular paper and, and just a real quick list. Yeah. Yeah. So we can have, we can talk about, um, you mentioned genetics. We can talk about diet and example, I, uh, especially, um, um, for, for American beef that export it to everywhere. Is this a good information? So that the people that are buying understand what to expect, uh, and again, a, a lot of it, sometimes they get frozen product and that, did you get to other factors there? Uh, cause I mean, you think about Asia, sometimes like up to 14, 20 days of, of, um, transportation. And then you can, you can talk about, uh, other things like stress, right. Managing, uh, with DFD and, and, and that type of thing. But uh, we didn't focus a lot on that for this matter. We, we just focused uh, solely try to to um, take into account post-mortem aging 
So, well, and, and some of the things that you called out specifically in the paper in, in under phase two was, was age of the animal. Okay. Um, uh, 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 sex of the animal, genetics, you've, you've already mentioned. Nutrition is huge, right? Um, were, were those animals uh, uh, grain uh, or, or concentrate? We can't say, just say grain because we don't feed everyone grain up here in the Pacific Northwest. Sometimes we feed potato byproducts and that's not grain, but we feed a concentrate of some sort that results in a similar fat. Um, so nutrition is, is, is a big deal. Um, and then you've mentioned also, as we've already said a couple of times, just, just muscle differences. Right. Yep. And, and, and differences of, of, of that. So, yeah. And, and going back to your point to animal age, and I think in the, in the United States, a lot of the animal that is harvest that is harvested is will be less than 30 months, but a lot of them will be what between 20, 22 months of age, uh, muscle type. And the thing about the, some of the opportunities for, for muscle types and, and, and where it comes from the animal is not a lot of the, the muscles have been, heavily studied like the strip loin or right. like the tenderloin you look at a lot of the papers when when they evaluate collar stability they focus on on this too so it's it's hard to start looking at other muscles because you may not find enough data yeah. to support a, a this like a man analysis study well and for our our uh, academic listeners out there that's opportunity guys you know um we need to know, know more about the tri-tip from from my home country, California, um, where where where, where tri tip is king. We need to know more about the briskets, so that uh, consistency and color for the Texans and those in the Kansas City area are just having um, that much more of a consistent, saleable experience for the customers uh, pulled through demand. So ultimately, there <laughs> this is just the beginning of opening up an enormous can of worms, but that's a good thing in a really good way because you need those worms for some pretty good fishing later on. And so, um, <laughs> you know, it's uh, so, so I encourage folks out there to um, take a look, even if you're not an academic, take a look at the journal Meat and Muscle Biology. This is the official journal of the American Meat Science Association. And that is where uh, Dr. Francisco Nahar's paper is published, along with a number of other papers of yours as well, Francisco. And we can go down those roads at some at another time. But uh, any other thoughts on on this particular study? Well, um, just uh, another thought. I know uh, we we mentioned and we talk about aging a lot in this uh, on, on like in this episode and and in previous episodes. But it's good to know that there's also another side of the coin that is. Uh, the impact of aging on, on color stability, and it's good to know um, that some of the of the opportunities for for all that meat with it's it's good to know. It's just a simple practice. It's good to know when you procure meat, go to the go to the side of the box and look at the packaging time, uh, look at um, and where, where it's coming from. And I think it's a good it's a good practice to have. I know I I do it all the time. I try to see okay, this this meat came from where and when, when was the animal harvested oh and i think i uh and i, I it's probably me i don't know if you you dr bass if you do all that oh I, box in panels and honestly you know francisco let's go ahead and document this right here in front of the world and everyone um we need to talk about box in panels and the and the vast amount of information that's on the ends of those those boxes um but that's for another that's for another day and time so all right but, uh, yeah all that information good to know um good to know where products coming from definitely good to know um the uh the time in which it was packed so that you can manage that particular product in your individual operation so anyway thank th you this has been fun it's, it's good it's good good yeah. stuff so. all right I, you guys have any questions so so yeah email us at info at uh, meetspot.com and uh, we address all the questions from you and, and we'd be happy to continue this conversation. Absolutely. Thank you.